Hello, everybody. Welcome to our September version of the Autism 200 classes. We're getting trickled more people in than uh, our hot and sunny summer where people were avoiding coming inside. And, and uh, so this cool and cloudy weather is bringing people back in. So we're uh, excited to have a, a lecture on sleep in autism this evening. And uh, we've got um, two great speakers, Dr. David Kamenish. He's a child psychiatrist at, and a um, pediatrician, and he works at the Seattle Children's Autism Center. He also um, works on the PAL, the Partnership Access Line, as a consul consul consultant to pediatrician, and also works in uh, Tacoma with the foster care population. And Dr. Mendy Meneres is a licensed uh, clinical psychologist, also at the Seattle Children's Autism Center. Uh, she's the director of the upcoming, uh, our upcoming early intervention program, and um, she has a special interest in behavioral intervention. So I think we're going to start with David, and thanks for listening. Good evening. Please let me know if you can't hear me. I'm going to be learning about this microphone as we go. Jim, how do we advance the slides here? And, uh, this guy? Quicker? Quicker? Yeah, try that one. Gotcha. All, right. All right, just to get us oriented here to what we'll be covering tonight, I'm going to start by giving you some idea what I mean when I talk about sleep problems and specifically insomnia, um, and then um, go over briefly the broad principles of treatment, and then I will. Um, hand off to Dr. Menjares, who will uh, talk about assessment and behavioral treatments. And then we will talk about uh, pharmacologic or medication strategies. I will come back and talk about that. We are being taped, and so in the interest of uh, keeping things moving, we're going to hold questions till the end, if possible. So please um, do keep track of your questions, and um, we will make time to get to them at the end. So insomnia, uh, lots of different definitions and ideas of what this means for the purposes of this talk. Um, we will uh, think of it in a couple different ways, but uh, broadly defined, it's any difficulty initiating or maintaining sleep um, or uh, being asleep in, in such a way that it's non-restorative and, and not uh, optimized biologically. And uh, usually for it to uh, cross into a problem area in this business, we look for identifiable consequences and impacts on functioning, and certainly those can be broad, as we'll discuss in a minute. Um, and that uh, these problems exist despite an adequate opportunity for sleep. Obviously, this is kind of where the rubber hits the road in evaluating um, cause and consequence of sleep problems. Uh, sometimes uh, best intentioned efforts uh, can complicate things further, and so it's really uh, making sure that the, the, the table is set for the opportunity to have a decent night's sleep. And um, there is much to consider in evaluating um, sleep issues, and uh, it does require usually uh, contributions from medical providers and then uh, other ancillary psychological or um, therapists of some sort um, to hit all potential areas uh, that impact sleep. Um, and just very generally speaking, breaking it down into primary or underlying biological causes versus secondary uh, to environmental or psychiatric issues. We're going to focus primarily on the latter. Um, and uh, certainly there's some, some overlap, um, but um, we'll be thinking uh, more about uh, implications in psychiatric treatment um, and environmental factors that relate um, uniquely to children with autism. Didn't realize I would have a tiered um, entry of all my information. So, um, so uh, consequences of inadequate sleep. Um, obviously, uh, tiredness, daytime sleepiness, um, and this can uh, manifest as often as externalizing problems, as internalizing problems um, in um, autism populations. This is. Um, commonly seen as uh, just simply hyperactivity, worsening of impulsivity, delayed gratification, uh, or inability to delay gratification, increase in repetitive behaviors, self-injurious behaviors, et cetera. 
um, over a longer period of time, it can uh, lead to mood disturbances that are more um, persistent um, and certainly can impact learning in a number of ways, attention, concentration, memory, um, not only in uh, the impacting the opportunity to take in information, but sleep is essential for uh, consolidating what we've learned and forming uh, long-term memory from uh, short-term uh, memory and so um, has long-term consequences for, for learning and um, certainly can result in uh, unhappy and exhausted caregivers, of which I hope there are not too many here tonight. Can I just get a show of hands of uh, who is here tonight? Are there uh, other uh, physicians or clinicians? Okay. Parents of children with autism, okay. um, teachers, okay. um, anybody I didn't, uh, someone who got lost and ended up here by accident? No. Okay. All right. That helps me uh, tailor some of my comments. Thank you. Um, so again, conceptualizing, there it is, um, uh, uh, thinking of the different ways this can impact um, um, it's um, helpful to break down sleep problems uh, into um, early, middle, and late, and um, early being difficulty falling asleep, middle being difficulty staying asleep, and uh, late uh, being early morning awakenings or uh, an early wake time that is disruptive to the household. Um, for the purposes of this talk, we'll be talking more about uh, insufficient sleep, fragmented sleep, and circadian rhythm disturbances. Um, and I'll try and be consistent in referring to early, middle, and late insomnia. I think that's probably a, an easier way to conceptualize it for the purposes of this. We won't be dealing with uh, the primary sleep disorders. Things to remember, um, and this is uh, just things I remind myself of as well as parents when we're talking about this. Um, Kids rarely complain of not getting enough sleep. Certainly, it does happen on occasion, but more often than not, um, it, it's other things that are picked up on, other things that are off, or the things, things that change that um, you know start to investigating uh, sleep, and, and that often uncovers the problem. Um, and uh, sleep, it's um, you know a very non-specific marker. It can indicate problems at school, problems um, with uh, breathing, problems with um, anxiety. Um, so keeping in mind that it's a very, uh, leads you to explore all different areas of your child's life or your student's life to think about um, what might be affecting that. And it is um, something that can quickly affect functioning, um, as we all may remember from our more intense academic days or uh, intense work schedules. Um, you know, it doesn't take too many nights of inadequate or poor sleep to start to show itself at work. Um, and so it, it can dramatically impact functioning very quickly. Um, and then uh, certainly it's important to make sure that as you're talking with your child's uh, teacher or caregiver or provider about sleep that um, you guys have the same expectations and concerns around sleep. Certainly, I've gone through my list of questions and come to a conclusion that, hmm, sounds like something is off here, only to learn that the schedule actually works pretty well um, for you know, a, a particular situation or for a family in a particular situation. And so um, make sure there's some consensus that you're, you're both working towards a common goal. And um, certainly, uh, one of the earlier signs that things are off here uh, can be caregivers and parents starting to feel frayed and worn out. And um, certainly if it's affecting your functioning at work, um, your uh, frustration tolerance, etc., that it's probably impacting your child as well. General principles of treatment that, again, I try and remind myself of and frame, uh, frame it to parents. Um, we try and find a, a cause, and, and ideally that has a associated diagnosis um, that helps us gear treatment or, or steer treatment in a particular direction. Uh, we don't always have that luxury and sometimes we're just left with uh, symptom driven treatment. But um, if at all possible we try and come to some consensus, at least a 
hypothesis about what's going on and work from there uh, because it can be so confusing and complicated. Um, it just helps to narrow it down if possible. Um, and sleep is complicated. For sleep to go right, many, many things have to happen. Um, and so, um, you know, it, it's important in sleuthing with your child's doctor or therapist um, or anybody else you're scratching your head uh, with about this that there's a number of things probably contributing. And so the first thing you come upon or the first decision, uh, the first uh, idea you have about what's going wrong um, may or may not be the whole picture and to keep, keep asking. Um, and in general, uh, you'll hear this message in different ways tonight. Um, the behavioral interventions, the, um, the strategies that involve changing how you approach sleep problems and manipulate the environment are really um, key here. And without it, um, there's going to be very limited uh, opportunity for sustained improvement. Uh, there may be some temporary improvement, but um, really we're looking here to, to teach a skill, which is learning how to sleep. Um, and for that, we need the, the, the hard work of behavioral therapy. And um, in general, treating sleep issues, um, and maybe even a little bit more so in uh, children with autism, progress is very slow. Um, it often feels like one step forward, two steps back. Um, that is the normal course. It doesn't mean you're failing. It doesn't mean your child is failing. It doesn't mean your doctor or therapist is failing. Uh, it just means it's a moving target. And what worked a couple weeks ago or last month or last year um, may be relevant, but it, it may not. Specifically in autism populations, there's a few things to uh, keep in mind. And, and um, certainly it's... Uh, a very common problem um, and it's a rare appointment where we don't at least touch on it. It's sometimes not the focus of treatment but it's so intimately related to so many of the things that I'm helping parents uh, and kids manage that um, it's, it's pretty much every appointment it gets brought up. So it's not unique, you're not alone, it's not that um, your skills are lacking in that area, it's that this is a, a very common problem. Um, there is uh, a, there's good evidence that there's biological differences in children with autism that uh, affect sleep, the impact of the um, prevalence of sleep problems. Um, abnormal melatonin regulation in several different ways has been looked at, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about melatonin as a treatment, but it's the brain's, uh, and it's, it's what the brain releases to help us go to sleep. and. Um, there are uh, a number of abnormalities that are commonly found in children with autism, um, which uh, explains in part the prevalence of these problems, but also um, under the right circumstances, the effectiveness of, of uh, treatment. Um, and then um, the sensitivities that often accompany autism in terms of things needing to be a certain way, um, sensory sensitivities, uh, need for routine, etc., sets the stage for compounding the biological challenges with uh, behavioral and environmental challenges. And then uh, add to that high rates of anxiety, which is not uncommon, separation anxiety symptoms, especially at nighttime, uh, nighttime fears, and then in more extreme cases where you have obsessions or compulsions that impact sleep. Um, you have a, a, a situation that's uh, ripe for challenges with sleep. And uh, the challenges managing sleep uh, tend to be a little bit more recalcitrant and severe. And so, um, you know, it is the case that several people will often be involved, uh, therapist, uh, behavioral therapist, uh, psychiatrist, pediatrician, in trying to help you manage these situations. And through it all, remember that in general, we have pretty good success helping kids sleep. It's, uh, it's not easy, it's hard work, but I would say more often than not, we make things better, not worse. And um, so um, um, hopefully you'll uh, take some tips away from here tonight that uh, you can use and um, convince you that there is hope. So common sleep problems we see in children with autism uh, they have highly irregular sleep-wake cycles. This relates to abnormal melatonin production and release. Uh, 
for the reasons I talked about regarding sensitivities and so forth, uh, difficulty falling asleep, um, difficulty staying asleep, certainly. Um, they sometimes will fall asleep easily and wake up in two or three hours for no apparent reason. Um, over a longer period of term, you can see more abnormal, uh, a broader range of, of normal uh, patterns for a particular child. So. Um, um, parents will often say that you know certain times of year, certain months are more challenging, um, and so you can get cyclic variation. Um, when awakenings do occur, oftentimes it's a bit more challenging and complicated to help children go back to sleep, um, and all of that adds up to insufficient sleep time. And for some reason, some children are prone to waking up early, again, for no apparent uh, reason at times. This may be related to biology and sometimes environment when you look uh, long and hard enough. Those are common to the general population or to ASD? That is just a uh, general way of, um, of thinking about the different types of problems. Um, I, I would, let me see if I can back up here. There we go. Um, I would categorize these as more prevalent in uh, certainly the irregular sleep-wake cycles, the prolonged and disruptive night awakenings. Uh, the early morning wake times, I think those are uh, more commonly uh, issues we're struggling with in autism populations. Uh, so I guess I would call this a, a, a more general list with some specific uh, problems for autism. Tips for uh, parents and anybody else who's interested going forward. Um, and this is, I guess, framed from more my perspective as a uh, psychiatrist who's often uh, fielding parents' questions and concerns about sleep, do make uh, a point to bring it up if it's at all a problem. Appointments are short, they get loaded with a long list of uh, things to be addressed, and it's good to be, let that be known up front because it is so complicated. Um, and certainly don't uh, hesitate to um, make a specific appointment to talk about it as you would with anything that's particularly challenging. Um, it sometimes can be a very effective um, strategy to, to really drill down and focus on it. Um, if you are approaching an appointment to discuss sleep issues, it's a great idea to do a sleep diary. Um, it will provide an abundance of information um, and all this is, is simply keeping track of when your child sleeps and when he doesn't, um, noting when and how long they are awake in the middle of the night, how long it takes to go to sleep, how many hours of sleep, those kinds of things. If you can identify uh, common variables that uh, lead to a poor night's sleep or um, behaviors that correlate with a bad night's sleep. Again, those, those can be very useful pieces of information and you're kind of getting a jump on rather than taking two appointments to get to an action plan, you can perhaps come away from the first appointment with a pretty good strategy. Um, and then certainly uh, consider how sleep issues, if you're going to uh, an appointment to discuss uh, irritability, for instance, you know, think about all that could be leading to that and, and certainly sleep is, is one of those things and so again important to bring it up if you're uh, seeking help for behaviors that could be related to insufficient sleep. Um, a sleep study uh, or refer to a sleep specialist can be appropriate um, and um, ask about that if you think it's um, uh, something to consider um, and uh, most psychiatrists can certainly screen for that and help you decide whether we need to enlist sleep specialists further. And then, of course, as I mentioned, be prepared for some, some hard work, uh, but certainly expect progress. And then, uh, if appropriate and if uh, um, agreeable to you, it's uh, important often to uh, add medication to a good behavioral strategy. It can um, help behavioral strategies be more effective and can uh, give you all kind of a needed boost to, to feel optimistic at the beginning. And from here, I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Minhares, and I will see you back in a few minutes. Okay. So... I am going to talk about that hard work of doing some of the behavioral interventions. Um, if I lose track of where I'm at, it's because I myself am sleep deprived. It's ironic to give a talk on sleep when you have an infant at home. It's 
kind of a bad idea, but we'll see how it goes. We'll see how far I get. So I'm going to talk a little bit about assessment and then mostly about treatment. And the treatments are really fairly specific. Um, and some of them actually sound a little crazy. So if you have questions at the end, definitely let me know because some of them are a little bit like, really, you do that? They're kind of counterintuitive. Um, but like we were hearing, these interventions, when they're, when they're tailored to the problem correctly, meaning that the correct intervention is chosen for the problem that's been identified, and when they're executed effectively are oftentimes really, really useful. Um, this is information I love conveying to people and it's stuff I love doing with families because it's oftentimes really effective. Um, it's, a, it's a rewarding problem to solve because it improves quality of life so much. Um, so when we're just looking at areas to assess, I cannot stress to you enough, and I'm sure that anybody who has dealt with chronic sleep problems has heard this before, but how important the sleep habits and the sleep hygiene are. Um, before I do any other kinds of behavioral interventions, I will spend a long time with a family talking about sleep habits and sleep hygiene. Um, and some of this is really tough for families, and especially for families of kids with special needs, because it has to do with maintaining routines. Uh, and sometimes that's challenging. I mean, it can be really challenging when you have a lot of things going on and if you're trying to go to a lot of different therapies or manage more than one child, maintaining that consistency can be a real, you know, a real challenge, a really difficult thing for families. But sometimes it is the critical piece as far as making some headway on this picture. So things to look at are uh, bedtime routines, and we'll talk a little bit more about some of those specifics. Sleep schedules, including naps. Naps can be the kiss of death in kids who don't still need them. Um, so older kids who are you know, maybe falling asleep in the car or who get off in their schedule and then because they had a bad night's sleep, they start to nap during the day and then that kind of perpetuates the problem. Um, kids who wake up at night for no reason, like you know, we were hearing, which is more common in, in kids with autism. Um, and really looking at what we need to do to help kids learn how to fall asleep independently. So, you know, when, when kids are young and babies and in toddlers, I mean, this is the focus of sleep training and all these, you know, there's a million books for typical kids on sleep. The reason is because sleep is a skill, like, like we just heard, and teaching kids how to fall asleep independently can be a real challenge if they haven't already learned that. Um, other areas to assess, bedwetting can be a big one, especially in kids with developmental delays because their toileting skills are oftentimes delayed. Whether kids have nightmares, which is sometimes related to things like anxiety or depression, but sometimes not. Sometimes kids just have nightmares. It's, it's typical, um, you know, both in kids with autism and in typically developing kids. Behavior problems certainly get in the way, especially around bedtime routines and compliance with bedtime. Um, and, you know, there's other, other possible sleep disorders, including medical causes, which are things that we won't talk so much about tonight, but they are important to pay attention to, especially if sleep problems have been ongoing and haven't been very responsive to other behavioral interventions. So kids who have night terrors, you know, kids who have breathing problems like sleep apnea, um, low iron does cause restless legs in some people, so that's one that's, you know, we oftentimes assess, but those are less, less common. Um, so uh, a sleep diary was mentioned, and a sleep diary is a really useful thing. It sounds kind of obvious, but one of the things that I really talk to families a lot about is you, when you have a bad night's sleep with your child, you wake up in the morning and you think you have a recollection of what happened, but oftentimes when you really think to yourself, like, what time did we wake up? And I know this firsthand right now. You know, like, what time did we wake up? What time did we fall back asleep? And you go, I'm actually not really sure. You know, like it was, we woke up sometime between one and three and we fell back asleep sometime between two and six. And what you really wanna know is more specific than that. So sleep diaries are very useful and I'll show you an example of one in really trying to document that more clearly. Um, a simple sleep diary is literally just what were the hours the child was asleep and what were the hours, hours that the child was awake. Um, and then you can certainly get more elaborate, so you can definitely get into information like, you know, what were behaviors that were occurring when the child was asleep or awake? What were other variables like, you know, whether or not they ate certain things that day or were overly tired that day? I mean, there's lots of things that you can obviously record, but just when they were asleep and awake is a big start. Um, also behavior logs and, you know, logging things like temper tantrums at bedtime or what does a child do when they wake up in the middle of the night? Are they hungry? Do they have to go potty? Are they just awake and they're like happy? And 
a lot of times with kids with autism, I hear families say, well, they're just awake and they're, you know, they're like laying in bed and they're laughing and playing and giggling or engaging in self-stimulatory behavior and they just seem like ready for the day. But it's two in the morning. It's not time for the day. Um, so noting all those things is really helpful. Also noting the adult response. So what are we as the adults doing that may or may not be helpful in that situation? Um, you know, it's tempting for adults to do a lot of different things to try to get kids to go back to sleep and those may or may not be helpful to actually teaching the child how to engage in, in better sleep habits. So here's a simple example of a sleep diary. It's literally just 6 a.m. all the way through 5 a.m. the next day. And here's what it would look like completed. Um, and this is really, I find this kind of a sleep diary, like this is what I like to use with my patients because I find it really helpful visually to be able to look at this and start to kind of track the patterns. I, I find this to be much easier than being like, okay, so last night you were awake from two to four and the night before it was from two to six. Um, because when I look at this, I kind of say like, okay, 7 p.m. to you know 7 a.m. That was a really nice night of sleep, awesome. Something funky's going on here that makes sense, you know, why the child went to sleep late. Now they're tired, especially because they only slept till 5 a.m. An earlier nap makes sense here, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and being able to kind of visualize what's going on, like, okay, we had two bad nights of sleep here. No surprise they slept in, no surprise they took another nap, no surprise they then went to bed later, and so on. Um, so we can really start to observe some patterns, you know, simple things like, oh gosh, look, when we have naps, we all of a sudden, went to bed later. Um, and, and sometimes we can start to just do some simple things to troubleshoot based on these data without doing any very elaborate interventions. So that's a really helpful way to track things. And not a lot of work. You know, it's, I, I have families just like make a slash mark through the boxes where the child was asleep. Um, so easy way to kind of track those behaviors. Um, so talking some about bedtime routines, I'm gonna bring up all these there we go. Um, the bedtime routine, I mean, I, I feel like I'm kind of preaching to the choir. You guys are mostly parents. You know the bedtime routine is helpful. But I think a lot of times people don't really think about what does your bedtime routine consist of? Um, and is it the way you want it to be? And is it the way that you think it's most effective? And has it gotten off track over time? You know, I know I find at our house, like, we establish a certain routine and then there's, like, drift. And I kind of all of a sudden go, that's, how did bedtime become 9 o'clock? Because two months ago it was 7.30. Well, summertime did that, you know. Um, so really looking at this stuff and really kind of trying to take stock of where you're at and whether it's the most effective routine that you could have in your opinion. Um, so some general parameters for bedtime routines that are useful. 30 minutes before bedtime is a good time to start the bedtime routine. So parents will often say to me, yeah, we have a bedtime routine. Bedtime's 8 o'clock, so at 7.50 we start getting on the jammies, and yeah, bedtime's not 8 o'clock if the routine starts at 7.50, because it's going to take too long. It's just logistically going to take too long. Um, so it's, it's, again, where sometimes these routines can be hard to implement because families are busy and, you know, time gets away from you. Um, but trying to kind of set that up in a consistent way is really useful. Then engaging in routine activities and doing those activities in the same order. So in children with autism, this generally works okay because they like that. They like that predictability. They're good at learning the routine for the most part. They're good at remembering what the order is supposed to be. Um, and, you know, people will ask me, like, well, does it really matter? Like, if we get dressed first and then brush teeth and so on and so forth. And the reason I think it matters mostly is because once the child learns the routine, it's much easier to execute. If you do it a different way every night, they're not really gonna learn it as well. Um, and if you just do it the same way every night, they just come to take it for granted and they'll sail through it much easier than if it's unpredictable and if they're not sure you know, what's the order today gonna be. Um, so I really do encourage maintaining the order of activities. Um, avoiding activities that might cause conflict. So you know, if, they're, if the child has terrible sensory issues around brushing their teeth, um, it's not that you're not going to brush their teeth, but maybe you don't brush their teeth in the 30 minutes before bed. Maybe you say like, okay, we brush teeth after dinner. Um, you know, maybe you make some, some changes like that that are just going to facilitate having more of a peaceful bedtime routine. Um, avoiding electronics is a big one too. It's, it's really, you know, oftentimes kids, especially kids with autism, will settle down and watch something. You know, they'll watch the iPad or they'll watch the 
Um, and it turns out that that's for the most part, not the best way to kind of get kids in the mindset and in the physiological state that's most conducive to sleep. And there's some interesting new data, you probably know the, these data better than I do, but um, there's some interesting new data that suggests actually that exposure to screens in general disrupts melatonin. Um, and in kids who are more prone to melatonin disruption in general, this is probably not something that we want to be adding to. Um, so avoiding electronics during that 30 minutes is useful. Um, not extending the routine. So everybody knows the typical thing, right? Like, I need one more glass of water and one more of this and I have to go pee and da, 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 a million things, right? So, but you know your kids. Think about what all the million things are. Get rid of the ones that just don't need to happen. Put the ones that do need to happen into your routine. So going potty one last time, for example, getting a drink of water, whatever they all are, and then stick to it. So this is a place where setting limits does become important and where you might have some tantrums initially when you do first start the bedtime routine um, because they may not be used to it or they may not be used to you being kind of so rigid about it and setting clear limits. Um, but that becomes key to getting them in the state that you need them in, which is to follow the routine and end up in bed kind of ready and prepped for sleep. Um, if you, don't, if you set the limits and you avoid extending the routine, the routine is by nature going to be adult directed. Um, and that is much more desirable than if the routine is child directed because they're not generally going to direct it in the right direction, as you can imagine and all probably know. Um, so one of the things that I sometimes do talk with families about is with kids with autism who may become overly rigid about this, sometimes a little variation is useful. And this is one of those catch 22s where it's like, well, I'm telling you to do it in the same order and do it the same way. But then we do have the problem where if the child becomes too rigid about the routine and then some little aspect of it is disrupted, then all of a sudden they can't fall asleep or they can't sort of get themselves in the frame of mind to get in bed because whatever, like the toothpaste ran out or you bought the wrong kind or, you know, some tiny little detail. So a little variation can sometimes be useful, but I would say that is, that's the exception, not the rule. Um, the rule is that consistency is, is helpful. Um, a few other things to think about. So figuring out what your regular, your child's regular sleep time should be is really important. Um, and again, I think this is variable for a lot of families, oftentimes because kids are resistant. And if you, you know, if you're just struggling at bedtime and you've got a lot of tantrums and, you know, or the child is coming out of the room over and over again, what time they actually go to sleep is probably really variable. Um, but that doesn't help them learn how to be good sleepers. And so if we can figure out a regular sleep time based on how much they need to sleep and try to kind of stick to that, that really helps build good habits over time. Um, a good way to calculate it is to, to do a sleep diary um, and keep track of within a 24 hour period, how much sleep are they getting? Um, so that you, you know, even if they're awake sometimes during the night or that you do sort of know, okay, like between 7 a.m. and or 7 p.m. and, you know, sometime the next morning they got X amount of sleep, that's going to give you pretty good data about how much you should be trying to get them to sleep. And then you can set their bedtime based on what time they need to get up. So if they need to get up for school at 7, back up the bedtime and figure out when it should be. Because going to bed too early can also be a problem. You know, if, if the child generally sleeps nine hours and you know you're trying to put them to bed at 7 p.m. and get them up at 7 a.m. you might be having a fight between 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. because they're just not ready to sleep yet um, so so having some data on how much they're sleeping and then sort of figuring out what that scenario is supposed to look like in a more data driven way more so than just a, like 7 p.m. seems like a good bedtime you know kind of a way um, can be really useful and then sticking to it a little variety, you know, is fair enough, but trying to kind of generally stick to the game plan really will help your cause. Um, so one thing, this is just kind of a, a little bit of a sidebar, but I do like to mention it because it's really helpful a lot of times for kids on the autism spectrum. Exercise can be really useful. Um, and doing it daily, doing it not in close proximity to bedtime, um, and making it pretty vigorous can be quite useful. So, you know, if kids are going to school and they're going to recess, for example, that helps, but, but figuring out are they actually getting exercise at recess? Like, if, do they wander around the playground or are they like running and jumping and getting some good physical activity? Um, 
kids who have physical disabilities, you know, obviously the, the vigorousness of that is going to be limited, but even increased activity is useful. So looking at some of those things during the day as far as, you know, what their activities are can be, can be useful as well. Um, and, and, you know, the other thing I guess for kids with autism that I like to mention is exercise, there's research that shows that exercise, vigorous exercise, again, where, you know, where the child is getting their heart rate really up and kind of breaking a sweat, not for a long period of time, but at least like maybe 15 or 20 minutes, decreases self-stimulatory behavior for a period following that exercise. So, so when you kind of think about the physiological effects of self-stimulatory behavior on kids with autism, it, it ramps a lot of them up. You know, kids who have a lot of motor mannerisms or who, are, who pace and flap and jump, those are not behaviors that are compatible with sleep. Um, those are behaviors that get them going. Um, and so doing things like exercise to sort of reduce some of that and get them a little bit more tired in general can be, can be I think, more beneficial in this population of kids than in the general population of kids. Um, so some of the, oh, yes, we have to talk about the bed. I was going to say some of the interventions, but no, we have to talk about the bed first. So the bed is primarily for sleeping. And I know that that seems obvious, but we all have a lot of habits around what we do in our beds. We, you know, people lay in their beds and watch TV. People sit in their beds with their laptops. Kids sit in their beds with iPads and all kinds of stuff. Um, it's not to say that like your kids should never sit in their bed and do something else, but it does help them to associate going to sleep with being in the bed if that's what they do for the majority of the time that they're there. Um, one of the things that really helps kids learn how to fall asleep is making associations. And we all have those things. We all have our like, oh, I can't sleep unless it's dark. Or, oh, I can't sleep if there's any little noise. Or, oh, I can't sleep unless I read for 10 minutes first. Those are not, that's not folklore. That's not arbitrary stuff. Those are all sort of habits and patterns that, that human beings have that help you to sort of get yourself in the right frame of mind and physiological state to initiate sleep. And so being able to sort of associate the environment with sleep for kids who are struggling to sleep turns out becomes a really helpful thing to do. Um, so, you know, I would say if the child doesn't have severe sleep problems, you can maybe be more lenient, but if they have a really severe sleep problem, it might actually be a good idea to, to get kind of rigid about the bed is for sleeping and that is all, and we're gonna be, you know, a little bit more strict about that than we might have been otherwise. Um, and then just thinking about the environment in general, particularly because, of course, kids with autism have a lot of sensory concerns. Um, so looking at noise, looking at light, looking at location in the house, you know, is it right next to the kitchen and you're banging around doing the dishes after you put them to bed, that kind of stuff. Um, and again, it seems obvious, but it may be exacerbated in kids with autism spectrum disorders. So now, some of the things that we do. So this is the most common sleep intervention, and this is one that, yeah, I want to get all these up there, there we go. Um, this is one that people probably have tried, um, and you may have had varying degrees of success with it. This is also what people oftentimes do when they're just doing sleep training with babies, where it's, it's kind of the cry it out method. Um, this, this you know, intervention is geared around establishing the routine, establishing the bedtime, and then putting the child in and leaving. It's, I mean, it's extinction. And what extinction is in behavioral intervention is where you were providing reinforcement before, so where you were essentially allowing the child to not be in bed and get away with things before, you're now setting a limit, putting them in, and making them stay, and withdrawing the reinforcement that was previously available, and sort of like whatever behavioral reaction they have, you're gonna ride it out. Um, and th that has varying degrees of success depending on the child. We'll talk about what to do if you can't ride it out because the behaviors get too severe. Um, but this works for a lot of kids, actually. This is an effective, if you can stand it, this is an effective intervention for a lot of kids. So um, the reason that it's called graduated extinction, extinction would be if you were just going to do pure extinction, you would put them in bed, leave them there, not go back and check or provide any reinforcement or attention at all. Um, I don't really recommend that because, for one thing, you do need to check on them and make sure that they're safe and that they're not, you know, like banging hard things on their window or doing, you know, trying to jump out the window, whatever it may be. Um, but also, I mean, there's a certain amount of anxiety, I think, for kids in just being like left in bed and sort of having that sense of like, my parents abandoned me and now I'm just stuck in here when this is not what I'm used to. Um, 
So if you're going to do graduated extinction, then you determine kind of a checking schedule. And you decide on a length of time, usually based on what you can tolerate, before you're going to go in and check. Um, and then you check on a schedule. So you say, like, okay, it's going to be every five minutes or it's going to be every 10 minutes. Um, and you just go in, you check, you're okay, get back in bed, it's okay, all right, I'll be back, you go. Um, and one of the things that you're doing when you do that is you're teaching the child self-soothing. It's, it's a little bit of like learning the hard way, um, but they are learning to sort of get themselves there because over the course of that, they're eventually gonna calm down. They are not gonna cry forever, I promise. I promise, promise, promise. They won't cry forever. Um, it's gonna feel like it, but it's not. Um, and somehow they calm down, right? So how do they do that? They ultimately do do it themselves and that allows them to start practicing that skill. And if you go in and check, you're kind of scaffolding it a little bit, you're helping them out a little bit, you're providing them with a little bit of soothing, but then you're kind of saying like, okay, now you've got to try it again on your own. Um, what you'll find is that when you go in and check and then when you leave, they, they're gonna go through the roof. So you, you, you'll feel like the checking is actually making it worse because every time you go in, they think you're there to reinforce the behavior and like be done with the process and then you leave again. Um, and so it, this, the checking can make it feel more stressful. Um, but I do think it's actually a useful, you know, a useful piece because you're, you are helping them with kind of their self-soothing process even though as soon as you go, they, they escalate again. Um, so you don't want to do this on a night like before your final exam or when you have to get up to f you know fly across the country the next day. You want to do this on a night where you can be tired tomorrow because it's not going to be fun and it's going to go on for a while. Um, and the likelihood is that they're probably going to wake up in the middle of the night and do the same thing. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But um, So you put them to bed, you check at the intervals, you don't provide them with anything else. And then what you can do is every night you can lengthen your intervals a little bit. So if you started with five minute intervals the first night, then the next night maybe you check every six or seven minutes. And you're just, you're teaching them to go a little bit longer and a little bit longer and to handle it a little bit more on their own each night. Um, they're gonna cry the whole time. It's not, I mean, none of, none of it is gonna be pretty, but ultimately what happens is the length of time that they cry is long. It's, it's oftentimes quite prolonged. It can be one to two hours the first night. Um, and over the course of nights, it shortens up. Um, so it feels terrible for the first couple nights, but it's usually pretty quick. Uh, I mean, if you're doing it consistently and you're really sticking to it, within a week, you're gonna see a substantial difference, if not a total decrease in their crying at night. Um, so it's, uh, it's effective when you can execute it. Um, so when you cannot execute it, what you can do is bedtime fading. And this is one of the ones where parents are like, you're crazy, we're not gonna do this because it involves keeping your kid up really late, actually. It's the opposite. Um, so yeah, somebody right there is like, what? <laughs> he's, he's looking at me like, you're crazy. But this makes sense when you start to understand the rationale. So if the tantrums are too severe and the behaviors can't be ignored, for example, if the child starts engaging in really dangerous behaviors when you leave them in their room, they start you know, banging on the window or engaging in self-injurious behavior, tr you know, trashing everything in the room, um, then I would not recommend extinction. I don't want you to leave here thinking like, oh, we just go let them trash their room and hurt themselves, no. Um, so if you, if you don't think you can do extinction, this is a good way to go. So what you wanna figure out is you wanna take some data on what time do they actually fall asleep within like a 15 minute period. So you, know, you go through all your rigmarole at bedtime and then what time are they actually shutting their eyes and falling asleep? Is it 10 o'clock, is it 11 o'clock, is it 12 o'clock, whatever it is when you finally are like, oh, they're down, thank goodness. Um, and kind of figure out what the average is and then you wanna add 30 minutes. So you wanna make it 30 minutes later. So if they're falling asleep at like 10 o'clock, you're gonna say, okay, bedtime's 10.30. Um, and, and so what you're doing is you're trying to set bedtime at a time where the probability they're gonna fall asleep is super high. Like they're, you're pushing it out to when they're so tired that, that you're not gonna have a, you know, a big prolonged thing with them. Um, and then you get your bedtime routine in order and you start it at that 30 minutes prior to what you know, the bedtime you've set is and you go through it. Um, and so you're establishing for them the association between that routine and falling asleep. So you can see the rationale. The rationale is we've got to execute the routine at a point in time that's close enough in proximity to when they're actually gonna fall asleep that they start to learn that that's the association. 
um, and you don't let them fall asleep before you finish the routine. So sometimes it's like you're, you know, doing acrobatics, like, no, we're not done reading a bedtime story. Keep your eyes open, <laughs> you know. Um, and then once you've done that for a few nights, you gradually and systematically move their bedtime closer and closer back to the desired time. So, you know, if you've done 1030 for three or four nights and you're like, okay, they get it. We're doing the routine. They're not having tantrums. They're going to sleep then you can, you know, the new bedtime is 10.15, do that for two or three nights. Now the new bedtime is 10 o'clock, do that for two or three nights until you back it up to whatever you think it should be, eight o'clock or, you know, something that's a little bit more reasonable. Um, and if they don't go to sleep within 15 minutes, then you don't do a bunch of monkey business, you get them up and you do the whole routine again a, a half an hour to an hour later. So it's again, it's because you're trying to teach them the association between the routine and falling asleep. So you don't want a bunch of monkey business happening in between or you're teaching them the association between that and falling asleep. So that's why you only let that go for 15 minutes. And if they're not asleep, you're getting them up and you're trying again at, at a time when you've increased the probability even greater that they're gonna fall asleep. Um, so the new bedtime is reached when they can fall asleep in 15 minutes or less. Um, so this is, really effective. It also requires you to be up late and it takes some doing. I mean, it's going to be over a period of time. This is one of those, you know, like David was saying, this is one of those hard work. Your evenings are not going to be relaxing. No nice time watching TV with your spouse after your kids go to bed while you're doing this. Um, but it's really effective. So if, it, if this is the intervention you need, it's well worth doing. Um, so comparing the two quickly, so graduated extinction, the first one, the cried out method, it works fast um, if, if, as long as you don't have those behavior problems that are too severe. You don't have to stay up as late. You're not doing this like, you know, backing up the bedtime thing, but you have to be able to tolerate some of the drama that happens at bedtime. Bedtime fading is going to be slower. It's going to be, you know, it takes time to, to get that bedtime routine established. And then if you're going to do 15 minute increments in backing it up, that's going to take you a few weeks probably. Um, you're going to have to stay up late, but this is better for kids with severe behavior problems. So, you know, if, if the child, like I said, is going to really be kind of tearing it up, this is a better route to go. Um, so sleeping through the night, graduated extinction is pretty much the same as what we talked about. So if the child gets up, you take them back to bed, you ignore their protests, you put them in bed and you just do the checking at intervals. Um, so it's really, it's, it's the very same thing, it's just in the middle of the night when you're half awake and sleep deprived. Um, you can also not go in right away. A common, common thing that happens is when a child wakes up, the parents go in right away. And a lot of times when kids wake up and start crying, they're actually not fully awake. They're not fully out of their sleep cycle. You know, we go through these sleep cycles every night where we go down into deep sleep and then we come up into sort of shallow sleep and those are oftentimes the points where you kind of wake up and maybe you remember a little something or you think you heard something and you kind of have this vague recollection of it but you don't fully wake up and then you fall right back asleep and sometimes kids fuss when they're at that level of sleep and they're kind of only half awake and if you go in to check what you're going to do is rouse them fully up out of sleep um, which is obviously not what you want to do so oftentimes waiting a little bit until you're sure that the cry is the real thing, the real cry, they're, or, or they're out of their bed, you know, where you know, like, okay, they're not asleep. Um, so that's, a, that's one I do oftentimes encourage parents, like, just give it five minutes before you jump on in there. Um, and then if you're going to do this, minimal attention, no conversation, no snacks, no, will you snuggle with me, will you lay with me, will you, you know, you basically want to just repeat what you did at bedtime in the middle of the night. Um, so, and then it's going to, Oh, over time they're gonna be sleeping better through the night. Sleep restriction um, is a little tricky, but it does also work really well. So sleep restriction is useful for kids who have sleep patterns that look kind of like that example sleep diary I showed, where they're napping, they're falling asleep late one night, getting up too early one morning, it's just kind of all over the place. So with sleep restriction, what you wanna do is do a sleep diary first, figure out how much time they're actually sleeping in a 24 hour period. So this does not include time awake in bed. We want a sleep in bed only. Um, take 90% of that so that you give them a little margin for you know, error. Um, and then adjust their bedtimes and wake times so that they're getting that desired amount of sleep and don't allow them to sleep during the day. And it's not quite as easy as like 
we're going to start it tonight and you're going to sleep perfectly all night and now we're done you, you do have to you know kind of monkey with it but it's um it's a good way to get kids to sleep when they're in bed not do other things in bed and not sleep when they're not in bed like in the car during the day and so on um so this is this definitely has to be based on data though this is not something i would do based on your intuition you've got to take a, like at least a week's worth of a sleep diary if you're going to do this because you need accurate data about how much sleep they actually need in a 24-hour cycle um this one is one of my favorite ones also because parents look at me like i have six heads when i tell them to do it but this also works really well um so for kids who wake up at night at the same time every night, so you know my kid always wakes up at 2 a.m., um, this is the intervention for you if that's what happens. It, it's not so useful if it's random, um, but if they wake up at a fairly similar time every night, this is great. So again, using a sleep diary, figure out what their typical waking time is, um, and then actually wake them up 30 minutes before that. So what you're doing when you do this is you're, you're shifting the sleep cycle a little bit. Um, so you barely wake them up. It's like when you go in your room and you know, in the room and check on your child and they roll over and they stir, or maybe they open their eyes for a sec and then they go back to sleep. It's just only that much. Um, but you're disrupting their sleep cycle just enough that they're gonna, you bring them up into the shallow part of their sleep cycle. Then the likelihood is that they're gonna go back into deep sleep and they're gonna be in deep sleep at that normal time of the night where they would have been waking up. So you're shifting it just enough that they're gonna sleep through, and so you kind of break that habit of like 2.30 in the morning, they always you know, wake up and their eyes pop open. Um, so if, if they wake up fully when you do it, like if you kind of miscalculate, then you just need to shift your schedule most likely. So you can move the time back like 15 minutes the next night and just kind of experiment with it. Um, so you know, then you're gonna be more likely to be waking them up again when they were back in heavier sleep, which is the goal. Um, so this is a good one for kids who wake up at the same time every night. And then, yeah, after a week, you can try skipping one and then sort of keep fading it out. And usually you've kind of retrained, you've broken that habit. A few other random, you know, a little bit more kind of anomalies that I want to just touch on before we get to more about the, some of the pharmacologic interventions. So, um, Nightmares are, are really common, and sometimes they go along with more sort of clinically concerning, you know, type of pictures like anxiety or depression or trauma, or, um, but oftentimes they don't. Oftentimes they're typical for, you know, for kids with autism and for typically developing kids. So there are some simple strategies, you know, as particularly for kids that are more verbal, that have some, some cognitive ability to kind of understand these concepts that are oftentimes really useful. So, you know, kids will, put a fair amount of faith in sort of these magic type strategies where it just makes them feel like they're protected. You know, there's, there's a special thing that's gonna protect you or a special, you know, object or teddy bear or whatever it is. Um, also just doing bedtime rituals. You know, sometimes parents are like, well, do I wanna play into that? Do I wanna play into their belief that there's monsters in the closet? They believe there's monsters in the closet whether you play into that or not. They're, they're, they usually don't just agree with you that it's not true just because you tell them the first time. They're gonna learn over time, but like tonight, right now, when you tell them that there's not, they don't always buy it. So you can play into it a little bit then and engage them in some rituals that are gonna make them feel safe or make them feel better. You know, let's get the monsters out of the closet. Let's, you know, open the closet and see that the monster's our friend and now he can get in bed with us and we can snuggle with him, whatever you wanna do. Um, but you know, it kind of gives the child a sense of control and it gives them some ownership over the things that they fear. And that goes a long way with kids, you know, when they have these ideas in their heads that they sort of don't know what to do with. Um, the other thing that we can do with kids is some very simple relaxation strategies. So um, progressive muscle relaxation, you know, which is just having them tense and hold certain muscles and then relax them. And you can sort of do it like from head to toe. So like scrunch up your face and then relax. Now scrunch up your shoulders and then relax. And with young kids, we do like the major body parts, like your face, your shoulders, your arms, you know, your legs, your feet. Um, but it really does, you know, physiologically, these strategies can be really helpful. Deep breathing, you know, just breathing in through your nose, out through your mouth, kind of breathing deep in your belly. Um, positive imagery can be really helpful, you know, going to your happy place kind of stuff, you know, what, giving kids things to think about that are pleasant as opposed to scary. Um, 
And of course, we have to modify this for you know kids' developmental level. But things like relaxation and deep breathing don't take a lot of, of you know kind of developmental capacity. So pretty young kids or kids who are more impaired with their autism can learn some of these strategies effectively. Um, Sleep terrors, um, I, I don't want to get too much into, especially because I want to make sure we leave time for the pharmacologic discussion. But um, sleep terrors seem to occur more during deep sleep. And so sleeping longer is oftentimes one of the things that's recommended for kids who have sleep terrors uh, because it causes sleep to be lighter overall. Um, it's not so good to encourage in kids who might wake up at night because light sleep might make them wake up more. So um, that's kind of all I'll all I'll say about that. Scheduled awakenings can, you know, if the sleep terror happens at the same time every night, scheduled awakenings can, can also be helpful. So that's again where you're going to go in, briefly wake them up, and then exit and let them fall back into deep sleep. So, some, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Some of the take home messages. So, really assessing. I mean, I rarely, if ever, do a sleep intervention plan without a sleep diary because you just don't really know what you're dealing with. It's like I said at the beginning, you kind of think you know what the patterns are, but when you start to write it down, parents are oftentimes surprised what the patterns actually are. Um, and then I think a, you know, a good way to think about a treatment hierarchy is start with sleep hygiene. Like really analyze your bedtime routines and all the aspects of the environment in detail before you decide that you're gonna embark upon you know, a more kind of intensive intervention. Um, then going the behavioral intervention route, and if those things are not effective on their own, then thinking about medications. Um, I, I do actually oftentimes recommend medications in conjunction with behavioral interventions, particularly for kids who have um, more behavior problems at bedtime, because it can be really hard to even implement the intervention if you can't sort of get those behavior problems under control. And oftentimes if we can you know, bring a medication on board, even kind of temporarily, it allows us to implement these interventions that, that can foster better sleep hygiene and better kind of sleep association. And then we can slowly, you know, take the medication out of the picture, leaving the child with better skills for falling asleep on their own. Um, so I, it's, it's not uncommon at all that after I've tried some behavioral interventions, I'll, you know, bring a medication on board for a period of time and then kind of see where that, where that goes. Um, so with that, we'll turn it back over to the medical side of things and hear about some medication interventions. Did you guys get all that? It's a lot of information. There won't be a quiz though, so don't worry. We promise. We promise. We test it I'm sorry? We test it at home. Yes, exactly. <laughs> a test of life, the light, the test of life. So, um, yes, yeah, so when um, Behavioral interventions do not give you the desired results, or often, as uh, Dr. Manera uh, suggested, um, often in conjunction with behavioral therapies uh, for a period of time, um, we, uh, we end up using medications. And what I have done here, um, I'm going to just preload everything here. So. Um, give you a few guidelines for the way I think about using medications in these scenarios. I think most have been mentioned. Um, and then we'll go through the major uh, classes or in some cases specific medications. Um, and um, I'll say it here and I'll say it uh, many times uh, in, in the future. The, these are not, uh, none of these medications are FDA recommended. And so it's an important uh, conversation to have about the risks and benefits. and. I think uh, we'd be doing that anyway, even if there were FDA indications, but it is just an area where uh, the reality is we don't have uh, some of the uh, government administrative support um, that we have in other areas of child psychiatry to use these medications. Um, so guidelines, um, I think we've made the point that it's not usually the first choice. Um, best uh, benefits are seen in conjunction with uh, behavioral therapies. Um, and it's always good to um, define uh, the end point, um, just as it is important to define the problem. You want to make sure that uh, you and whoever you are working with on this have the same idea of what progress or uh, ultimate success is going to look like. Um, otherwise, you can just add frustration to an already frustrating situation. Um, and think about medications as a short-term temporary strategy. 
um, or if uh, is, is not unusual, it becomes more of a uh, longer term treatment that periodically you make efforts to um, get rid of the medication. Um, as uh, Dr. Manharas was suggesting that um, the goal is to teach the sleep habits and sometimes medications are very effective in getting that going. I use the metaphor of training wheels. Ultimately, we want to teach the brain to go to sleep and stay asleep and um, medications can help that and then we take them away slowly and um, away we go. Um, and then uh, certainly, um, you know, people think about uh, medicines they purchase without a prescription uh, differently um, and some are, some aren't and so just make sure your doctor is aware of uh, everything you are giving your child to help with sleep. Uh, best thing I could recommend is bring the bottles in. There are so many preparations and so many um, combinations that um, that's just a great time saver. And um, should you get to the point of considering medications, educate, uh, I mean it should be part of the discussion you have with your doctor about um, what the options are, the pros and cons, but do make sure you um, are aware of uh, the side effects that you should keep an eye out for. Uh, so melatonin, um, one of the most common used sleep medications. As I mentioned, it's got um, a uh, biological uh, or endogenous, as we say, um, analog. It's essentially what the brain releases to um, put, put, uh, put us to sleep on its own. Um, this is a, uh, you know, when it's used as a medication, uh, purchased in the drugstore, it's a um, animal analog, um, and so um, it's it's not human melatonin, but uh, it's essentially the same uh, compound. And it is probably the most commonly used, and um, for a number of reasons, because it has uh, um, um, essentially what the brain makes, and um, because it's available without a prescription over the counter. Uh, typical doses are one, three, and five milligrams. It's now available in an extended release preparation, which um, is a little tricky in that melatonin uh, released um, endogenously normally is um, a pulse that's released and it is not sustained through the night. So it's something that your brain releases to put you to sleep, but it does not uh, keep putting it out through the night to keep you asleep. And so while there is some um, uh, success using the extended release, um, I don't think it's clear what that does to the endogenous uh, system over a long period of time, but for problems um, with middle of the night awakenings, it can be a uh, solution that gets you over that hump in addition to other strategies that then gives you an opportunity to uh, teach um, sleeping through the night. Um, there is good research supporting its use in um, children with developmental uh, issues, including autism. Um, it is a uh, short-acting um, chemical in its pure form, and so it's important to time its use um, in accordance with the sleep schedule uh, that you have come up with. Um, you want to um, time it so that the window of tiredness is used. If you start the routine um, uh, too late and you miss that window, uh, sometimes kids have uh, paradoxical uh, rebound or activation or more commonly it just simply doesn't work once you get through that uh, past that 60 minute period so make sure you give it at the uh, at the optimal time and that can take some trial and error um, there can be as with most sleep medications um, inherent to them but also a function of dose there can be some morning symptoms, you'll hear that a lot with uh, each of the medications I discuss, and um, it's really, again, just finding an optimal dose where it's effective to help with sleep, but then it's not lingering in the morning and making uh, getting up too difficult. I would say our most common second line is the antihistamine family of medications, also available over the counter. Uh, I've put some uh, generic names of the more common antihistamines, uh, diphenhydramine is uh, Benadryl, hydroxazine is Vistaril, uh, but really I think the only one, or doxalamine, that's an over-the-counter as well, so you can sometimes find that. So uh, the first and third are over-the-counter 
options. The second, I believe, is, is only prescription. Um, in this case, we have little evidence, but a lot of experience. And so sometimes that's what we have to go on. And, and usually by the time uh, kids are in my office, parents are in my office, we're, we're, we're willing to consider that uh, or consider options where maybe we don't have uh, the, the uh, evidence we would like. Um, with this class, uh, there is tolerance more often and more quickly than, say, we see with melatonin. So it's not uncommon for this to work effectively for a few weeks and then lose its effectiveness. And again, that's a, a very uh, uh, common occurrence. And so it doesn't mean, again, what you're doing isn't working or the medicine isn't working. It just means your, body, your child's body is accommodating to it. It may be as simple as adjusting the dose. Um, but again, here we then sometimes take the opportunity to um, take a break from the medication to resensitize uh, to it or uh, change classes of medication. Um, it does have uh, fairly common and, and usually benign side effects of dry mouth, uh, urinary retention, constipation, um, all those things you hear mentioned really quickly after most drug commercials. Um, but it's rare that, you know, I, I can't say that I, I have kids or parents coming back and complaining and that being a major hurdle. Uh, the body adjusts and, and, and really it's just thinking about, you know, do any of these have any um, particular relevance to your child? Do they already struggle with constipation, for instance? If that's the case, this may not be the, the, the best place to go. And um, there's also the potential with these medications for instead of having them go to sleep, they uh, want to stay up and do all kinds of things. And uh, the obvious uh, advice if that happens is uh, only do it once. And, uh, and then, then we'll find something else. It's, if, it, if it happens uh, the first time, it's probably going to keep happening. That is not something that's going to change over time. Very hard to predict uh, who these kids are going to be, um, but it's, it's evident pretty quickly. Um, and then keep in mind that uh, these, uh, these medications, uh, these drugs are in uh, lots of different over-the-counter preparations. And so if you're using a regular uh, sleep aid, um, maybe just good old-fashioned Benadryl, and then you buy something like um, NyQuil for, for a cold, there's a good chance it also has an antihistamine. And, and all of a sudden, you've really changed the equation on how much of that family of medicine your child is getting. Trazodone, this is where things start to get a little bit more complicated. Um, it is um, a very commonly used sleep medication in children and adults. Uh, pretty good um, track record, although it's not without its uh, um, characteristic side effects that can be problematic. Um, a morning hangover headache is pretty common. And so um, it's really important to find the least or the, the lowest effective dose um, so that it does not linger. It is in the antidepressant family. That raises a lot of questions and concerns sometimes for parents about whether, um, you know, there's, there's, uh, it's, it's a heavier hammer than we need. Um, the short answer is yes and no. Um, in the doses that are used for sleep, it has very little to no antidepressant activity. Um, and we're really just capitalizing on some of the other actions of this drug that help children fall asleep. Um, and uh, it too has some of the same side effects um, uh, that the antihistamines do and has a few uh, potentially uh, serious but very rare side effects, um, including effects on uh, heart conduction and um, a side effect in males that um, is a prolonged erection that can be painful and can lead to some uh, medical complications if it's not addressed. So, um, you know, this is one where um, you have to consider the child's, the, for, for uh, boys you're using this in, uh, it's important to consider their ability to communicate um, prolonged erections or any pain, associated pain. Um, and in certain cir circumstances, I'll, you know, have parents uh, be more aware of uh, that potential. Alpha agonists, these are medications that have their primary use as antihypertensives, um, but have a host of uh, applications for ch child psychiatry. Um, 
They are effective sleep medications, but here we start to get into the sleep medications that we use. Um, I would say in the case of these medications, really um, very rare that it's being used only for sleep, um, or I should say being the only medication used. So for instance, um, they're commonly used in children uh, who are taking stimulants for ADHD and have trouble settling at night. So that's a very common scenario. Um, and more and more as we're using these medications to help with impulsivity unrelated to ADHD or aggression, uh, irritability, those kinds of things, um, uh, these medications will be used. And, and typically, they're started at nighttime because they are effective in improving sleep. And that gives us an opportunity also to um, see how uh, problematic behaviors improve as we uh, help children sleep better. Um, but these are medicines that are used most often when you have other things you're uh, targeting in treatment, whether it's impulsivity, hyperactivity, aggression. Um, there are no studies that specifically look at their use for insomnia, but again, clinical experience is, is uh, very uh, positive. And um, again, the, the evidence for their use in ADHD, for uh, irritability in children with autism, um, and in some cases for anxiety, um, are, is, is pretty good. And so um, we've got a lot of uh, different clinical areas where we have uh, good, good support for their use. Um, there can be uh, uh, tolerance that develops so that they become less effective over time. Um, this is an a particular issue with these medications because they have a very narrow dose range. They're very um, potent medicines that are uh, used, um, again, in, in very narrow increments. And so um, if uh, your child develops tolerance to the sedative effects and it's being relied on primarily as a sleep aid, um, there's often um, uh, uh, no choice but to change class of medications. But um, I haven't found that, um, uh, that the tolerance develops um, nearly as quickly with, uh, as with the other medications, for instance. So these, these medications can be very effective um, over uh, months. Clonidine, a few additional comments just because it is the more typical one here. Um, it, much like uh, melatonin, it's got a pretty short period of time where it is um, most effective, um, that has um, pluses and minuses. Um, if it's timed appropriately, it can be effective in helping kids fall asleep, but then also staying asleep through that initial light period of sleep that occurs shortly after initially falling asleep. Um, and so it can reliably get you the first uh, two to four hours. Um, because it is short-acting, um, a uh, not uncommon thing we see with short-acting medications is they have a uh, kind of a recoil or rebound effect when they wear off. And so, um, it, you know, uh, sometimes parents will tell me that kids uh, will fall asleep fine and they'll stay asleep for two, three, four hours and then they'll wake up. And um, it can be, excuse me, a function of the medication wearing off things going back to the normal state or sometimes often being a little bit worse. Um, and for that reason, kind of understanding these patterns, sometimes there's a role for a sleep diary even after we start medications to, uh, to make sure we're not creating more problems than we're solving. Um, most common side effects by virtue of being a blood pressure medication, uh, dizziness and low blood pressure, those are usually monitored, the blood pressure is monitored. Um, certainly should be checked before your child starts on this medication. And then um, depending on you know, how sensitive um, or labile your child's blood pressure has been with other medication trials, uh, family history, medical issues, um, your child's doctor may choose to check blood pressure after every step. Um, usually you can get away with every other step or so unless it's clear that you know, uh, this is really um, uh, medication that he or she is sensitive to and then checking with every uh, increment is not a bad idea but um, um, certainly every uh, few increases. 
Um, and the higher uh, this dose is taken, um, it becomes more problematic if it's stopped suddenly. And so, uh, as with any of these medications, um, you know, certainly using it the way it is prescribed and intended is the safest route. And so, um, but do be aware with this medication that uh, um, uh, stopping suddenly can be problematic. And it does, uh, there are a couple reports of fatality when they are used in conjunction with high dose stimulants. Um, I'm not aware of any uh, fatalities when they're being used alone for sleep or for managing other behavioral problems in autism and whether that's a function of um, some interaction between the stimulant and this medication or simply that's the population where these are most commonly used um, or uh, used in higher doses, I, I can't tell you. Remeron, um, otherwise known as mirtazapine, also an antidepressant. Um, it is used commonly with uh, difficulty for difficulty falling asleep, um, but it is one of the few medications that I found to be effective for um, trouble falling asleep, wakenings in the middle of the night, and waking up in the morning. Um, so um, it can be a, uh, a good alternative. Um, it is uh, not as frequently used, and so um, can take a little bit more time and discussion to consider with your child's doctor, um, but can be effective. Um, it tends not to have much in the way of antidepressant effects at low doses, much like trazodone we discussed. And uh, it, unlike trazodone um, and unlike just about every other medication we use, uh, at lower doses it is more effective as a sedative or a sleep aid. And so um, this may be one that your child's doctor uh, starts at the initial dose and leaves at the initial dose. And if that works, great. Um, and it may be a case where going higher may not get you what you want. Um, it is um, sometimes utilized in situations where appetite may not be so great um, because it does increase appetite. That has pros and cons. So uh, if kids are struggling with uh, weight or eat to self-soothe, it's not one we would use. The SSRIs, otherwise known as selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, I've listed several, uh, are the most common ones there. Um, rarely used by themselves as sleep aids. They're just not, they're not effective sedatives. They're used really only when you have pictures of depression or anxiety that are, in, that are impacting sleep. Um, interestingly, they do ha have sufficient uh, benefit for sleep, and um, it's much more subtle. It's not at all related to their sedative properties. It's related to how they impact uh, sleep architecture or the normal cycles of sleep. And so um, it, it certainly is reasonable to expect sleep to improve over a period of weeks if these medications are started for, say, a picture of anxiety or depression where sleep is a major symptom. And um, whereas I, I would say I used to more commonly think about using something like trazodone and uh, medication uh, in this family when we've got anxiety or, or depression that involves um, sleep problems, more and more um, I am trying these alone if the situation is tolerable uh, because the difference in the amount of time that sleep improves dramatically is, is quite small and certainly uh, nice if you can get away with one medication and don't have to worry about uh, multiple medications or interactions. Uh, some are considered more sedating and some more activating. I can't say that I've experienced uh, a clear pattern. Um, and um, sometimes this may be where um, you share some of your own experiences with these medications with your child's doctor because there are uh, hereditary or genetic um, uh, patterns that um, you may be able to uh, find the most effective one sooner if you have found one that's been effective for you. Tricyclic antidepressants, um, even older antidepressants uh, than some of the others we've talked about. Um, 
These are effective sleep aids by virtue of them being um, much dirtier drugs. They impact many different receptors in the brain, um, but this brings with it lots of side effects and lots of drug-drug interactions. Um, I think uh, most commonly we see these medications where we have issues related to uh, nighttime bedwetting um, and a few other uh, medical scenarios, but um, really uh, not, not used too terribly often. They can be effective when other things haven't been successful, but um, really important to be aware of the potential side effects and, and um, any um, other medical issues that are uh, going on with your child before you go down this road. Benzodiazepines include uh, clonazepam, also known as clonopin, um, and then lorazepam, also known as Ativan. Those are the two most common, I would uh, say, we, we use um, adult populations. You'll see the, uh, or in, in adults, you'll see the other two more commonly, but uh, really try and stick to the longer acting um, options in this family. Uh, for the very reason we were talking about earlier with the shorter acting medications, you're more likely to get a, um, a, a rebound effect. And so um, that is minimized with the longer acting preparations. Um, for a number of reasons, these are um, much more stringently used as temporary treatments. Uh, tolerance can be, uh, is very common in that in this uh, family often leads to dependence. Um, the extent to which that's a problem in, in Children with autism versus other children, I, I couldn't tell you, but um, we just try and minimize the opportunity for that problem by limiting uh, the duration of, of treatment with these medications. They can be very effective, though, especially in certain circumstances where anxiety is a major issue. And so um, uh, they, are, uh, they are used with some good benefit. Um, and. Um, the other issue with these medications in children is that they do impact learning. Um, they affect the sleep architecture in a way that can prevent consolidation of, of new material that's been learned um, and thereby impact memory. Um, in certain circumstances where there are medical causes of sleep issues, uh, they can worsen things. Uh, obstructive sleep apnea, where you often have uh, collapsing of some of the airway muscles. Uh, medications um, in this family tend to relax those muscles even more and can exacerbate breathing problems, which then uh, cause more nighttime awakenings. They also slow respiratory drive and uh, can be fatal in overdose. So this is a class of medication where um, you do not want to give uh, additional doses over what is prescribed and certainly Maybe I didn't say, but it goes without saying. Uh, all of these medications should be closely supervised by adults and out of reach and um, um, not at all accessible. The atypical antipsychotic medications being used uh, more and more for a range of, of behavioral problems and psychiatric issues. Um, and in many of those scenarios, sleep is an issue. Um, but uh, they are not recommended exclusive when, when insomnia or sleep problems are the only issue, um, really only used when you've got uh, significant aggression or irritability in, in children with autism or um, there's overlap with mood problems, uh, psychosis, or in some cases, severe ADHD. They've got lots of side effects, lots of things to think about and talk about with your child's doctor. Um, and uh, in my role as a psychiatrist at a specialty center. Um, often by the time children get in my office, pediatricians have tried often A, B, C, and D since they're more comfortable with these uh, or those options. So this is often um, one of the earlier conversations I have with parents. But um, so, um, you know, it's certainly uh, not uncommon when you've got other issues you're, you're dealing with or other problems you're trying to target, but um, in the big scheme, it's, it's really a, um, I'd say, fifth or sixth tier consideration um, and um, should not be taken lightly. Herbal supplements, um, 
There's kind of interestingly a lot and a little to say on these. Um, this is an area where a common message is that they're, um, you know, generally safe but largely untested. I think, you know, the problem with uh, this is it, 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 um, it, it, it's probably kind of true that there's not a lot of problems and complications, but the reality is we, we hold our other treatments to a higher standard, to, so to say, just go out and use them, don't worry about it. It's a, it feels a little cavalier to me. There are a few uh, for which we have some evidence and information. Um, I try and keep apprised of, uh, you know, um, any new information that comes out, but it's a, it's a broad, uh, a broad, a long list. And so if, if there are certain things you're interested in, in trying, um, you know, certainly give your child's doctor time to take a look at uh, what they can find from their trusted sources and, and see um, if it makes sense. Um, and several have serious uh, potential side effects. Um, and um, so they should be considered uh, serious medications. Um, but um, uh, again, just make sure you're uh, sharing the information with your child's doctor, bring in, um, bring in the bottle, and, and if uh, possible, allow some time to kind of come to a consensus about whether it makes sense or not. Um, a lot of times uh, these will be prescribed by um, uh, non-allopathic medical professionals, so naturopaths, homeopaths, um, and uh, other, other folks sometimes even. So um, if there's an opportunity to have your doctor talk to that person and learn what their experience with it is and their professional perspective, uh, that's always the best way to go. Um, so. Just check it out with your child's doctor first and uh, keep in mind that they are potentially very uh, uh, real medications that can have some very real side effects. I think that is it. How are we doing on time? Wow. All right. We've got a roving microphone. So we're um, we're being. Explain one more time the differences between, or, or distinctions rather, between early, middle, and late insomnia? Sure. Um, so um, just to be clear, that is one way of categorizing insomnia. There are many. Um, early is difficulty falling asleep, sometimes called sleep uh, difficulty with sleep onset or sleep onset latency. Um, middle insomnia is uh, night awakenings and um, uh, Dr. Manhara has made a good point. I want to emphasize waking up in the middle of the night is totally normal. Um, in fact, coming out of shallow sleep is normal. It, it becomes an issue when it's uh, prolonged or disruptive. So middle insomnia is prolonged, disruptive awakenings in the middle of the night. And then uh, late insomnia is um, also called early morning awakenings or early awake times or um, things that happen at the other end of the night. I've got a um, daughter with low tone, and she's had problems with GERD in the past. And I'm, I find it difficult to figure out. She wakes up four hours every night, no matter when she goes to bed. It's four hours later. Is that a typical sleep cycle, or is I know that's also the highest production of acid mm -hmm. uh, right about that time at night too? Is and she can't tell me if she's having any heartburn. Is that a typical cycle? Typical for. Um, in, it might, I mean, for your, for your daughter, it, it may be her, her pattern. Are there other times of, um, 
does she then is she up for the rest of the night or does she fall back asleep does she open does she awake in four hour intervals or she does, does she really well if we give her something like yogurt or milk uh -huh. well that that's a great solution um but yeah no i mean i think um trying to see if there are um solutions like that that are effective um you know in it's it's tricky to talk about typical patterns in terms of uh, whether that's um, typical for the highest acid production, I, I couldn't tell you. Um, there are certainly um, uh, treatments you could consider with her doctor to treat reflux and see if, if, if that's the precipitant. Reflux can certainly uh, cause uh, irritation and, and, and uh, conceivably lead to awakening. Um, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a reasonable hypothesis to consider there's a connection there. Um, and doing what you're doing to try and um, you know minimize that and see if it gets her through the night I think is a very reasonable approach yeah because she's intermittently been on Pepsid mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, good suggestions. Other questions? Yeah. Um, I have a question about the gradual extinction approach. So if um, my child is typically used to falling asleep, um, on, uh, falling asleep um, with some music on, is, is it a recommendation that when he wakes up to not put the, me like the routine of music or to just, you know, very good question because it's a really common scenario that kids have where they fall asleep under one set of circumstances that is then different when they wake back up. It's the very same thing that happens when kids fall asleep with you laying with them and then they wake up and you're not there. So to answer the question you asked, which is would the music be helpful in the middle of the night? Yes, because that's obviously what the child's used to. The long-term intervention that I would recommend, actually, though, is to try to slowly see if you can fade the music out. Because what happens, usually, in that type of a situation is when a child goes to sleep with a certain set of parameters in place, one of the things, you know how I talked about when they wake up into that sort of shallow sleep and they may not be fully awake and then you go in and check on them and they wake up? Another thing that happens is when they come into that shallow sleep, if the environment that they're in is altered from when they fell asleep, that actually sometimes stimulates kids to wake fully up. Like, where's my music? Or where's my mom? Because it's different than when they fell asleep. And so the fact that he goes to sleep with music may actually be worsening nighttime awakenings, where if he was used to falling asleep without it, when he wakes up in the middle of the night, he may not fully wake up out of sleep, if that makes sense. So as a short-term solution, to just get him back to sleep, yes. Putting the music back on is the best way. You're just recreating the bedtime routine, which is what you'd want to do. As a longer term solution, I would say seeing if you can you know, slowly, not just necessarily kind of cold turkey, we're not doing music anymore, but seeing if you can slowly kind of get him used to you know, having the music on for a shorter period of time or maybe at a lower volume and kind of fading that out as a, as a part of your routine so that when he wakes up during the night, that's not the thing he's relying on to fall back to sleep, if that makes sense. And that's true of anything. I mean, that's, it's the most common scenario like that is the scenario where parents are laying with the child and then the child wakes up in the middle of the night and the parent isn't there, and so rather than kind of like rolling over and going back to sleep, they fully wake up because they're aroused by the fact that something's different. Um, so anytime you have, you introduce something into the bedtime routine like that that's gonna be different when they wake up during the night, you might experience that kind of situation. So I'm glad you asked that question, it's a great question. And similar to like um, the white noise machines and things like that, are those 
What, uh, have there been any studies about those? I don't know of any studies. I mean, I would say that any, you know, there's lots of different things that are helpful for people. So anything that's helpful is fine. Um, a white noise machine, you know, if depending on what kind it is, I mean, sometimes those are things that can just be on all night. So, I mean, if, if it's something that stays on all night, that's actually probably more effective because then when they wake up, it's still on. So the parameters are still in place that they went to bed with. If it's the kind, you know, like for babies that have like sleep sheep and that kind of stuff where after like 45 minutes it turns off, you're gonna have the same thing where when they wake up the room's quiet, that might kind of arouse them to be awake. Um, but you know, the other thing about that that I'll say is in kids who are really struggling with sleep, I mean, sometimes things like white noise or music can be really useful. So if that facilitates your bedtime routine, I would not say don't do it just because you might have a problem in the middle of the night. I would say do it to kind of get your routine in place and then over time think about how if you need to, you're gonna fade that out. Um, but sometimes it's so hard to just get a good bedtime routine in place that you know anything that you know is soothing is something that you should definitely be potentially relying on. Uh, so yeah, good question. Other other questions? 